Welcome to this week's edition of What the F Just Happened. This is Eric Dubin, joined by Dave Kranzler, and we're recording Saturday, July 14th. Had a pretty interesting day with market actions, trade war, commotion brewing, people wondering how that's going to impact our markets, and price of gold retested what we bird dogged as likely a bottom and certainly a bottoming process that we're seeing this month that comports with seasonal trends in the price of gold over the last three years. July has been a month where things have turned around. Dave, what do you think uh, is going on? Well, apparently the trade war is a non-event. I mean, the stock market doesn't isn't bothered by it. Uh, I have a theory, and we can get to the stock market in a second, but I have a theory that uh, I actually think Trump has ordered the working group on financial markets <clears throat> and the Fed, <clears throat> otherwise known as the plunge protection team, to make sure that trade war news doesn't doesn't affect stocks. And I mean, you know, there were several days last week when the stock market started to go into a tailspin at the open, and then half an hour later, it was green. I mean, yesterday's a good example of that. But I wanted to just circle back to something because I my, I, my one of my overriding theories on the economy is that the average household is is their disposable income is getting squeezed. It's not a theory because I can back it up with numbers right from the Fed's website. But I, I got a little ticked off because uh, Bloomberg wrote an article. Consumer sentiment fell again, and it was well below expectations. It was below the level where it was in June. And she prefaced it with consumers are feeling a bit less confident as they grow more concerned about trade wars. And I'm like, what? And I go, oh, yeah. My response to that was, why would the average American care about the trade war? You know, and according to today, today's import export price report, the cheap goods from ab abroad flowed in at an even cheaper price in June. And I said, I, I bet the average American doesn't even really follow economic news that closely. I mean, they probably see headlines and hear sound bites in the news, but that's about it. And then I followed up by saying that. I said sentiment is falling because, as I've demonstrated with actual data, the average household disposable income is getting squeezed and the average household is getting crushed by debt. And what makes this worse is that studies have shown there's almost a one-to-one -one correlation between the direction of the stock market and consumer sentiment. And since May 1st, the S&P is up 6.7%. So you would think that consumer sentiment would be rising. And I think what's happening is the average household's economic predicament right now is overriding their, their, you know, their interest in the stock market and how the stock market might affect their, you know, their expectations going forward. So, I mean, that's yeah. why that's why sentiment's falling. I mean, households are having trouble making ends meet. Yeah. And, you know, the granddaddy of all sentiment surveys is the University of Michigan survey. That's what the reporter was referencing. The uh, survey has been polling what Americans think about uh, the trade war as it's growing in their consciousness. It's not part of their standard survey that is the actual month-to-month -month reporting of what is the University of Michigan survey for sentiment. So they put this number out and uh, pulling the statistics here, 38% of respondents spontaneously mentioned a potential negative impact from tariffs in the latest survey, up from 21% in June and 15% in May. The actual tariffs that are being implemented and the impact to the economy is non-existent almost for the most part, other than specific industries. The average consumer isn't going to feel this just yet. This is all a response to the news cycle. And in the last three months, the whole trade war meme, if you will, uh, it has been percolating into the consciousness of uh, the American people. So it's registering on this survey, but it's not really having any meaningful impact in economics. No, so, I mean, according yeah. to the government's own reports, imp imported goods were cheaper in June than they were in, in May. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, consumers are benefiting from a stronger dollar. And, and you know... Most markets worldwide, stock markets, have been favorably responding to all of the action since this trade war has been ramping up. So your theory is spot on, and everything is counterintuitive. 
that's the way it is in an Orwellian world that we're living in. And I, I just wanted to just segue quickly back to the stock market because, again, it's the, just looking at the Dow or the S&P or the NASDAQ or the Russell is misleading. Uh, CNBC, of all sources, put out an article last week, and I happened to just come across it because I was digging up, I was looking on the Internet for data for my short seller's journal. And this actually kind of opened my eyes as well. I mean, I knew it was it was something like this, but three stocks are responsible for 71% of the rate of return in the S&P 500 this year. Amazon, Netflix, and Microsoft. And those three stocks are responsible for 78% of the rate of return in the NASDAQ. Now, the NASDAQ closed at a, a new all-time high last week. If you removed those stocks from the index, the NASDAQ would be substantially below where it is right now. And same with the S&P. And the concentration, as you pointed out earlier, Eric, and we were talking about it, the concentration, is, it's three stocks driving driving the indices as opposed to 1999 where, you know, we could name six or seven or eight stocks right off the top of our head that were that were sort of the, the highly concentrated stocks pushing the NASDAQ higher. Yeah. Back in those days, they frequently reported the big five and that they represented something on the order of about 82% of the stock market's move going into the March 2000 top. And now we have a higher concentration in the S&P 500 and NASDAQ in terms of, you know, smaller number of stocks representing the lion's share of the move of the indices. That's right. So, you know, my I guess my point here is, is that the, the technical underpinnings of the stock market are actually quite negative. Because if you remove those stocks, you know, all the indices would be a lot lower. In fact, you know, most of them would probably be right around the lows that they hit at the, I think it was the end of February or mid-February after the initial plunge in the stock market. So, um, and one thing I thought that was interesting, I mean, as, as we know, I mean, our audience listens, you know, reads Zero Hedge. Zero Hedge has been posting that chart where it's, it's the most highly shorted stocks that are really kind of pushing stocks higher on any given day. Um, and most, a lot of those stocks are in the Russell 2000. Well, the Russell 2000 looks like it may have just had a double top. It hit a, it hit a new all time high on June 20th and it, it tried to, it actually closed two points below that all time high on July 9th and then promptly rolled over. So I'll be watching the Russell over the next couple of weeks to, to get some signs as to, you know, whether or not this market's getting ready to break lower again. I mean, in, in terms of the fundamentals supporting valuations, this, this stock market has never been more disconnected from fundamental reality than it is right now. Well, what do you say we turn to gold? When we did our last show, we were looking at that July 2nd, 3rd bottoming out process, thinking that that might have been the bottom, but looking at July seasonally, three years running, marking the bottom with trends that we can see with sentiment being as horrible as it is now. We stuck our neck out and said that, hey, this is, this is a bottoming process, and we may have even bottomed on the second and third. And this Friday, we clipped a tiny bit below where we were on that second, third. But we bounced back, and that uh, that hitting of uh, the slight testing and the exceeding low on an intraday basis came in, the, in advance of the comics open with the London PM fix. And it sure looks to me like uh, the powers that be that are managing these markets were trying to cover shorts and or elicit the ability to take uh, physical gold off of the LBMA. What do you think? Well, you know, we've heard these reports about there being physical shortages over in London. And I mean, for what it's worth, Andrew McGuire was on King World News last week saying, or maybe it might have been late the week before, saying that according to his sources, there's been, I guess, some German banks that have refused their customers when they go in to, to take their gold out of the bank. They've, they've not been giving it to them. You know, in terms of the credibility of those reports, I'd consider the source. But 
uh, you can actually see the physical tightness on the LBMA. I, you know, we subscribe to this John Brimlow gold jottings report and he, he publishes, I think it's comes out with three market updates. He covers the bullion market globally and all week long in his London report, the PM fix was characterized by it. It would take like, you know, five or six iterations in order to, to clear the buyers and the sellers. And what that mean, what, you know, to put that in context, normally a, 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 the fixing might take one or two iterations. So you got sellers come in and put the physical gold that they want to sell or indications of the physical gold they want to sell at a certain price. And, and then bids fill in to, to buy the physical gold that's offered that day. And the fixing process is, is obviously the marrying of, of the price between the buyers and the sellers to clear the amount of physical gold that um, it either wants to be purchased or sold. Well, all week long, there were very heavy offerings on the PM fix, and it would take four to five to six iterations each day to clear the market. And that that's usually an indication that the market is tight. And I, I would suggest that the initial offerings were – some of them were, were, you know, what's known as spoofing, where the seller wasn't wasn't a serious mm-hmm. seller. They were just trying to push the market lower. So, in, in, in terms of the way, in, in terms of the way the fix has been behaving all week long, and really for the last couple of weeks, it's it's indicative of a market that's tight in physical supply. And the other interesting thing that's there is that. Uh, seasonally, July is is the lowest month, the slowest month for India to import gold. And with the price down here, with, it wasn't too long ago we were testing 1360, and now we're at 1240. The Indians have been importing remarkable amount of gold, given that it's July, and you know we're not even close yet to their seasonal buying period. And that's when I think it could get really interesting. So their seasonal buying period for their their holiday and festival seasons um, is, is pretty much spans the fourth quarter of the of the calendar. So if this physical tightness persists, it, it could make for an interesting fall for the bullion market. But as you pointed out, I mean, right before the PM fix started, the price of gold went straight off a cliff. It dropped from 1241 down to 1236, and this is based on the August gold future. And it, it did that in the space of about, I don't know, 15 minutes and it bottomed out. And then it, it just, it, I mean, it, it was like one of the tightest V bounces I've ever seen in gold, you know, and it's, and when the COMEX yeah. opened gold shot right back up over, over 1240 and it peaked at 1244 before they were able to get control of it again. And Obviously, the the August future closed at twelve forty one, which, uh, you know, again, it doesn't invalidate our call that we said we, we think we're putting in a bottom. And I, I, you know, I qualified that call by saying, look, on any given day, at any given moment, they can take gold as low as they want, or they can take it a lot lower using paper, as long as they don't have to deliver the the gold, the underlying gold represented by that paper. They can push it down and and you know, it'll bounce back up. And I'm sure when they push it down, they're hoping, you know, a, a lot of buyers get scared off from buying it. And I think that's what the intent yeah. is. I mean, all things considered, we can easily go a lot lower in gold for sure. I mean, we could do 1220 and hit support lines from where we were last year and just going back even further. And on an intraday basis, testing where we were on July 2nd slash 3rd makes perfect sense. And here we are. Well, this coming week is really going to be where the rubber meets the road in terms of whether or not that was an exact bottom. But we're in a bottoming process. A lot of commotion and people debating whether or not we're in a stealth bull market. We're still in a stealth bull market. The long-term trend lines are, are holding. The miners look horrible, generally. But, we're you know, the GDX, for example, <clears throat> closed at 21.96 on Friday. And it was in June at 2177, even when gold is higher. The miners always lead. The miners have not been breaking down as fast as the bullion has been breaking down because of the fact that bullion is being attacked directly. But the longer term holders, they're in miners. The stronger, longer term minded investors are positioning themselves in miners. And you know that better than anyone. 
Sure. You know, I'm looking at this. I'm, I like blew up this August futures chart, and I got to tell you, Eric, because um, I had thought that um, we ticked lower on on uh, Friday than we ticked on July second, and actually, this thing is showing me that the futures <laughs> ticked as low as. 1230 or 1229 at one point. It was probably just very brief, but that's what this COMEX mm -hmm. August futures chart is showing. And we, we bottomed out yesterday at 1236. So, I mean, if you're looking at a daily chart on, on gold, you could actually argue that at least yesterday, a double bottom was successfully tested and it, and it didn't yes, right. bottom quite as low on an August futures basis as it did on July 2nd. Yeah, that's right. Isn't it funny how, you know, it's always on a Friday when the rest of the world's gone for the weekend <laughs> that they use the paper markets to smash gold or a day like July 2nd when no one's around. I mean, you know, New York empties out on that week, you know, with, with the 4th of July, with the holiday on a midweek and they, you know, they turn it into essentially a, uh, a nine day hiatus, you know, Saturday to, to the following Sunday. So, um, it, it's just, it's amazing how the, how the media it escapes their attention that whenever gold gets hit, it's typically, you know, at the slowest times of the market, but there's nothing to see there, right? <laughs> the big picture that we've painted all year with these shows is that the economy is turning down. It's being masked by government reports. The stock market is still. Moving forward because there's a lot of momentum, but the market is very unhealthy. High concentration of uh, key stocks moving to market. 20% of the S&P 500 already in a bear market. And now we have the trade war ramping up. And in the last 100 years, there's never been a trade war without it spilling over to uh, impact economic sentiment and bringing down stock markets. And, and we have stock markets rising right now <laughs> in response to, you know, among other things, people being optimistic, even though there's a brewing trade war. I mean, it, it, can you get any more Orwellian than this? Certainly not. Just circling back to what I was, what we were discussing about with the stock market in terms of three stocks driving the indices. There's a lot of opportunity for shorting this market and myself and my subscribers have been making a lot of money shorting the home builders. I mean, the home builders are, are technically in a bear market right now and every bounce in the home builders is a money making opportunity. But I'm going to have an interesting idea this week and it's, it's not a short per se. What I refer to it as is a contra NYSE fiat currency play. And um, I'm actually kind of excited about that. We might actually put some in our fund and um, I'm definitely going to buy call options on it personally. So I'll be discussing that in the next issue of Short Sellers Journal that'll be out this Sunday. And for folks that are interested in checking out Dave's work, you can find all of his free blog postings and keep track of his analysis during the course of the week at investmentresearchdynamics.com. And he has two newsletters. One is the Short Sellers Journal and a newsletter that covers precious metals and mining stocks. So this has been What the F Just Happened with Dave Kranzler and myself, Eric Dubin. If you'd like to follow what I post periodically, you can find my work over on Facebook.com slash Eric Dubin. This show is brought to you in part by Wall Street for Main Street, and you're hearing it on the Wall Street for Main Street YouTube channel where Jason Brock and his team post a lot of great stuff. So click on the name Wall Street for Main Street and you'll pull up the channel and see all of the other great work that Jason Brock and his team posts.